Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast sharing how to create and grow income streams and manage, multiply, and protect your wealth in the new economy. Are you tired of trading your time for money? Do you desire freedom today instead of retirement in 10, 20, or 30 years? I'm MC Lobsher, and this is the Cashflow Ninja. Hello, Cashflow Ninjas. MC Lobsher here, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you. In today's show, we're going to look at litigation, finance, cash flow. And in today's show, I'm joined by Jay Greenberg, who is the CEO and president of Lectures. Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks, MC. Appreciate you having me on. I'm extremely excited to share about the innovative asset class of litigation, finance, and Lectures with your listeners. Fantastic. Uh, can you please share a little bit about your background and journey before we dive into litigation finance? A absolutely. So I am the co-founder and chief executive officer of the commercial litigation firm Lectures. Uh, Lectures, by public account, is the most active single case commercial litigation funder in the United States. And prior to founding Lectures in 2014, I was an investment banker at Deutsche Bank. So I was in Deutsche Bank's technology investment banking group in both Boston and London. And I was mainly involved in mergers and acquisitions, equity and debt underwriting for very large enterprise software companies. And you know, I, I loved being an investment banker, but sort of always wanted to start something on my own. And in 2013, decided to leave the bank and, and do just that. Um, you know, that said, after sort of taking a self inventory of my skills, I realized my skill set was primarily limited to that of a corporate finance practitioner. So I began to look at different alternative asset classes that I could build a platform around, which was really when I stumbled across litigation finance. And, you know, I say commercial litigation finance and the term litigation finance means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I think just to level set, when I'm talking about litigation finance, I'm really speaking about litigation finance in the commercial sense, where the type of litigation we are typically financing is between two business entities. So these are claims like breach of contract, breach of fiduciary duty, antitrust, fault claims act cases and the like. So we do not fund any personal injury cases or torts which would be an entirely different market here in the U.S. So, you know, sort of as a high-level example, you know, let's say Cashflow Ninja Incorporated has a breach of contract lawsuit against company XYZ. And let's say Cashflow Ninja Incorporated needs capital to pay for litigation expenses and to pay for hourly legal fees. We would provide Cashflow Ninja Incorporated with a non-recourse investment. And that non-recourse investment would be strictly collateralized by the future proceeds of this lawsuit. So if Cashflow Ninja loses this lawsuit and does not receive any monetary recovery, they would not be obligated to repay lectures. It is completely non-recourse. If Cashflow Ninja wins their lawsuit, lectures would be paid out of the financial recovery of that legal claim. So that's sort of a, a high level example of how commercial litigation funding works in practice. Very interesting. Now, uh, if you don't mind, if you could tell us a little bit more about the, the industry, the players, uh, who's involved and how this is all uh, structured. Yeah, absolutely. H happy to do that. I, I'd sort of take one step back before I talk about the industry and sort of, you know, come off talking about sort of how I got interested in this space. Like I said, I was sort of a corporate finance practitioner by training. And, you know, the reason why I was initially attracted to commercial litigation finance as an asset class in 2014 were really four unique attributes that the asset class entails. I'd say the first thing that really attracted me to investing in litigation was sort of the, the lack of correlation to capital markets or broader macroeconomic factors, right? Because it doesn't matter how the stock market performs or how interest rates fluctuate or how commodity prices perform. 
the return associated with these investments is really dependent upon what occurs inside of this courtroom vacuum. And so, you know, as you and your listeners probably very well know, it's difficult to truly get exposure to a zero beta asset of this nature. So it's sort of the lack of correlation is what really drew me into this asset class initially. And then the other thing that I always thought was interesting was, you know, investments in legal claims come with an inevitable realization event. So sort of unlike other alternative asset classes where monetization events may be uncertain, right? You know, let's say you invest in an early stage technology company. There needs to be some sort of catalyst to get to a liquidity event, right? That company needs to be sold or it needs to go public. Well, with investments in legal claims, that realization event is inevitable by way of either settlement or that case being adjudicated, you know, positively or negatively in court. So inevitable realization is also something that attracted me to this asset class And that sort of rolls into the next attribute of the asset class, which is what I would call a moderate investment life cycle. You know, on average, the a civil case that's filed in the U.S. takes about 27 months from filing to disposition. So if you sort of look at that in the context of other alternative investments like real estate funds, private equity funds, venture capital funds with a large lockup period, you know, that investment life cycle is, is fairly moderate. And then sort of the, the fourth thing in 2013 when I got involved in the industry was really looking at historical returns. You know, at that time in 2013, there were a couple publicly traded hedge funds out there in both London and Australia, you know, and they were quoting annualized returns in excess of, you know, 60% per annum. And so the question for me after sort of seeing that was, you know, why weren't more people investing in this asset class? Because to me, litigation finance at the time sort of looked like private equity in the early 1980s. You know, it truly seemed like there was this undercapitalized market and you had this dearth of capital that was chasing an abundance of really high quality investment opportunities you know, which should enable the creation of significant alpha. And, you know, sort of after I did a bunch of research, what I found was the reason more people weren't investing in this asset class was really because there was this education gap, right? I thought I was a sophisticated investor. I had no idea at that time that a lawsuit is a capital asset that I could invest in. And on the flip side, plaintiffs and attorneys may have heard of litigation finance in theory, but really had no streamlined way to access this asset class. And so the genesis of LexShares was, instead of hiding behind the opacity of fund structure to create an online retail forward-facing marketplace where we could first educate all constituents in these transactions, investor, plaintiff, and attorney, on the benefits of litigation finance, and then in turn, you know, use what I would call securities deregulation in the United States at the time with the Jobs Act and capitalize what was seemingly an undercapitalized market online. And so that's exactly what we set out to do. So lectures initially started off as what I would call a fundless sponsor, where we were responsible for originating these deals, underwriting these deals, structuring these deals. And when a traditional fund would invest out of their proprietary capital, we would then post these deals to our online marketplace for our base of both individual and institutional investors to capitalize. And we ended up doing 75 deals on that basis, establishing a very strong track record And then at the beginning of 2018, off of that track record, raised our own discretionary fund vehicle that we call Lectures Marketplace Fund One, that now invests side by side each time we post one of these opportunities to the online marketplace at Lectures.com. So, you know, I'd say there, there are a few sort of interesting aspects to the Lectures platform that we can certainly cover as we delve into the conversation. 
And I'd say one is really how we originate our deals. We use a piece of software that we developed in-house called the Diamond Mine. And two is obviously that unique aspect of how we capitalize these deals because they are both capitalized through our own traditional closed-end discretionary private equity style fund and this online marketplace. The 1% grow their business and investments every year, regardless of the economy and marketplace, and pay very little or no taxes legally. Besides having the right mindset, elite strategies and tactics, and the counsel of elite wealth advisors, coaches, and mentors, they have access to opportunities that the rest of the population do not. If you're an accredited investor, we have a network that provides Cashflow Ninja listeners access to exclusive business and investment opportunities. To join our investors network, please apply at CashflowNinjaInvestorsNetwork.com. That's CashflowNinjaInvestorsNetwork.com. Gotcha. A lot of interesting stuff there. So non-correlated to any financial markets. There is a liquidity event, as you said, without having to sell an asset. It's kind of that's that that's what makes this very very attractive. Um, let's stuff. Uh, let's touch a little bit on what are some of the risks, and then maybe after you cover some of the risks and the risks that you have to manage in this investment and asset clause. Um, if you want to touch on uh, and share a little bit more about the origination of the cases, how it's underwritten, how you guys price it. Yeah, a- absolutely. So I, I think. You know, we can sort of touch on in, you know, obviously, you know, risk is obviously part of the asset class and sort of how risk is transferred in these legal claims and, you know, why plaintiffs and attorneys want to offload risk of litigation to a third party. You know, obviously, the risk associated with these assets is that a case is not won and monetary recovery is not received. And there's obviously a lot that we do at Lex shares in order to mitigate that risk, right? And proper underwriting and evaluation of these claims is really how we mitigate that risk, right? So Lex shares employs a team of former litigators who we call legal underwriters that essentially are underwriting cases. And what I mean by underwriting cases is that, you know, first what they're doing is they're looking at the merits of the case, right? What I mean by that is how well does the fact pattern of this case align with prevailing law, right? So for example, you know, was there a contract? Was that contract breached? Does prevailing law say that we can breach contracts? Obviously not. Right. So through reading the pleadings of a case, speaking with the plaintiff, speaking with the attorney, our underwriting team is going to ascertain, is this case meritorious or not? Sort of the second pillar of our underwriting process in order to mitigate risk is in evaluating the strength of plaintiff's counsel. Right. Plaintiff's counsel, the one who's actually responsible for litigating this matter, you know, we have to have trust in their abilities. So we want to see plaintiff's counsel representing matters in which we invest who have a strong track record of litigating similar types of claims previously. And really, the third pillar of our underwriting process is defendant creditworthiness, because it's great if we have an extremely strong fact pattern that's being litigated by a top tier attorney. But if we win that case, we need to ensure that the defendant is able to pay on that recovery. And so those three things really allow us to mitigate risk through our underwriting process. You know, I think obviously before a case can be underwritten, we have to find that case. We have to find that investment opportunity and we need to originate it. And so, you know, when LexShares first launched in 2014, up until about 2016, we were completely reliant on what I would call our inbound channel to originate these investment opportunities. So a plaintiff or an attorney would, you know, read about lectures in the Wall Street Journal or click on a Google pay-per-click ad and come to us and apply for funding. And that was all well and good, but by 2016, we realized that 
we couldn't just be reactive and wait for deals to come to us. We needed to be proactive and reach out to people that had fundable claims. And so what we decided to do at that time was deploy resources to develop a piece of software that we call the Diamond Mine. And essentially what the Diamond Mine does is it mines cases on the federal docket and at this point over 100 state court dockets that could potentially be fundable. So what we're doing is we are downloading the legal complaint for those cases. And the issue with electronic filings for lawsuits in the U.S. is that they're filed in all sorts of disparate file format. So once we download that legal complaint, we do optical character recognition on it, parse it into raw text. And then once we have that raw text, we're able to run a 17 parameter algorithm that we've developed over that raw text. So, you know, first it'll look for in that legal complaint, are there natural language strings for cases that we like to fund, right? How many times does it say unjust enrichment in this legal complaint? How many times does it say breach of fiduciary duty? Then it'll look for quantitative metrics, right? Are there damages named in this complaint in excess of $5 million? That'll give you a boost in algorithm ranking. Who's plaintiff's counsel? Is plaintiff's counsel highly reputable counsel? That'll give you a boost. And then each day, our business development team is receiving a list of cases that we believe to be fundable. We're reaching out to those parties, both plaintiff and attorney, explaining to them the benefits of litigation finance, seeing if it could potentially be helpful for their legal claim. And then if it's a fit, that case would be passed along to our underwriting team to then be evaluated. And that's really how we originate claims at LexShares, you know, which truly differentiates us from other litigation funders in the market that predominantly work on sort of a more traditional inbound deal origination basis. My friend Brian Page has created a cash flow machine generating over $100,000 in six months without owning any real estate. His system consists out of renting properties from property owners and renting them out on Airbnb. His system is so simplistic, it can be managed by virtual assistants and yet so effective and powerful that it predictably generates cash flow every month. Brian and I are hosting a webinar where he shares his system and how it generated over $100,000 in six months for him personally. You can access this life-changing webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash BNB. This is one of the greatest cash flow opportunities I've seen since I've started my podcast. Again, the URL is cashflowninja.com forward slash BNB. Very, very interesting. Um, and what are what is the future of this? How many companies out there? I mean, what what is the investment opportunities like for investors? Um, and how do people get to participate in this? And maybe you could bring that all together in the the future outlook for this asset class. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. So you know, if you sort of look at the folks that are currently participating in our industry, you know, I'd say really at the top of the market you have institutional investors, investment banks, multi-strategy hedge funds, insurance companies. And they're really attracted to investing in commercial legal claims because of the uncorrelated nature. Now, you know, large players like that typically do not have the in-house ability to originate, underwrite, or structure these transactions. Um, But obviously, they're attracted to it because of the unique attributes of the asset class. I'd say sort of directly below them in our industry are dedicated litigation finance funds like lectures, right, who, you know, generate their alpha strictly by investing in litigation related assets, you know, and I would say sort of right below them are individual investors, right? So if you are an individual investor and you are looking to get access to this asset class in the only channel currently that I'm aware of for an individual accredited investor to get exposure to this space is through lectures.com, right? So you're able to come on our platform, you're able to register as an investor, and then you're able to actually see and evaluate litigation finance opportunities that we've posted to our platform and invest side by side 
along with our own discretionary fund product. So I'd say those are really the, the three constituents that are currently investing in the space. You know, I think sort of the future of litigation finance, we're really still in early innings. And I think what we're going to see just as any, you know, asset class grows and matures is increased standardization and transparency. You know, right now, it's not like there are Bloomberg league tables for litigation finance. But, you know, I, I think as our asset class grows and matures, we will definitely see things like that. So, you know, participants in the industry and users of our product will be able to see, you know, who is active in the space, who has discretionary capital to deploy. But I think the other thing we're going to see is the entry of mainstream financial institutions into this market. So the continued participation of large investment banks, insurance companies. And I think what that is going to lead to is a growing market for secondary transactions in our space. Because like I mentioned, a lot of those larger players do not have that in-house expertise. So they're looking to purchase prepackaged deals. And I think their ability to get exposure to the space will be easier if they can purchase those prepackaged deals through the secondary market. I think sort of a, a third a third on the future of litigation finance is really going to be consolidation. You know, our, our there's been a lot of capital which has flowed into our space over the past few years. And I think sort of, you know, as the incumbents in our space begin to build out scale, you know, people are really going to try and differentiate themselves. And I think, you know, some folks will falter due to lack of discretionary capital you know, or the inability to properly originate or underwrite deals. Um, I, I think two other points regarding the future of our industry is that technology is going to play an increasing role. You know, I think technology is going to play an increasing role on the origination front, as we've already seen with our own diamond mine software. I do, however, think that artificial intelligence, and I get asked this question a lot, you know, is artificial intelligence going to be able to predict the outcome of legal claims, you know, and be a large boon to litigation funders? You know, I think that's really overblown. I think we're, we're a very, very far ways off from artificial intelligence being able to effectively underwrite investments in this asset class. And I'd say sort of for the fifth thing regarding litigation finance, is just an increase in the sophistication and expertise of the participants in the space. And that's definitely something we've seen over the past five years. It's very interesting. So the uh, the software, basically, that you guys use, that's that's the, um, the competitive edge, number one. And number two, uh, that's also from an underwriting and originating this case and underwriting it, also looking at certain probabilities of the case Number one, being successful, meaning winning it, um, and then also more or less what the approximate payout would be. Is, is that a correct assumption? Yeah, the Diamond Mine is really responsible for sourcing and originating these opportunities, so basically providing some real-time filtering. But uh, human capital, those legal underwriters, you know, are really one's responsible for digging into these cases, actually performing the evaluation of the merits, the damages profile, the budget of the legal claims. You know, that, that's really still the purview of human capital, given, you know, the great nuances of each and every individual lawsuit. And I sort of, you know, for, foresee that being, you know, for, for you know, the, the long term, I think sort of uh, an AI or sort of a, a compute replacement to underwriting is a far ways off. MC Lobshire, the creator of the Cashflow Ninja and Cashflow Coach at Producers Wealth, where we help our clients integrate infinite banking with their business and investments. To learn how you can create your own banking system to turbocharge your investments and business in 30 days or less, go to your own banking system. Dot com. That's your own banking system. Dot com. Now, an, uh, another question that I had was: so uh, uh, investors, accredited investors, right now, they have the opportunity to invest in a specific deal. Correct? It's not a fund yet. So, as cases come in, they are allowed to participate in a specific and a 
private placement memorandum for a specific case, and it's not a fund. Am I correct in assuming that? Yeah, we, we actually offer both on the LexShares platform. So we offer the ability for individual and accredited investors to invest in singular cases. And then we also offer a diversified fund product, which invests in all cases which are posted to the LexShares platform. So accredited investors have the choice of how they want to access and get exposure to the space through the platform. Okay. Very interesting. Let's, uh, Jay, if you don't mind, if you could walk us through a deal from basically finding the deal, uh, originating the case, underwriting it, pricing it, and then rolling it out on your platform for investors, what does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially, first, that case is going to be originated through the diamond mine, right? So so let's say the diamond mine finds a, you know, a, a breach of contract case and The plaintiff in that case, once our business development team reaches out to them, is looking for a million dollars. And they've already retained an attorney on contingency. So all of the costs of their litigation are being borne by their counsel, you know, except that the litigation, this pre-settled lawsuit is really the largest asset that's currently on their balance sheet. But prior to litigation finance, they were unable to monetize it. So they're looking for a million dollars in working capital for their company during the pendency of this litigation. So once we collect some initial information about that claim, that opportunity would get passed along to our underwriting team. And our underwriting team is going to speak with their counsel. It's going to read any pleadings that are available, review the docket, speak with the plaintiff themselves. And if our underwriting team believes this is a high quality investment opportunity worthy of investment, we would provide a term sheet to that plaintiff. And that term sheet is essentially going to stipulate in exchange for that million dollars of financing that we're going to provide on a non-recourse basis, it will lay out the pricing. And typical pricing for us is a multiple of that principal investment is time elapses. So let's say for the sake of conversation, in the first 12 months, it's a two times multiple on that million dollars provided, right? So if that case is resolved within 12 months via the case settling out of court or it being adjudicated, the plaintiff would owe us $2 million in total out of their proceeds. Let's say it takes between 12 and 18 months, maybe it's two and a half times. 18 and 24 months, three times, up to a certain cap. And so from there, if the plaintiff accepts those terms, we would then provide them with definitive document, typically in the form of a purchase and sale agreement, because we are purchasing any future proceeds coming out of the recovery of this lawsuit. Once that purchase and sale agreement is signed and we complete all of our final diligence, we would go ahead and then post that opportunity to our online marketplace. And so all investors on the lectures.com platform would be notified via email that a new case is available for investment. They would be able to log on, request access to see the details of that specific opportunity. And then once granted access, they would be able to read about the plaintiff, read about the defendant, the judge, the jurisdiction, the summary of the case, what transpired, the engagement with plaintiff's counsel, and then they would be able to review for themselves any underlying legal documentation, right? So if they wanted to dig in and read the complaint themselves or, you know, order on a motion to dismiss or motion for summary judgment, you know, we provide all of those publicly disclosed court documents on the platform as well to be reviewed. And at that point, an investor could make a decision to invest. They're able to subscribe directly through the web platform, sign all of their investment documentation. uh, And then from there, their investment is consummated. And so just to play this out full circle, you know, let's fast forward and, you know, let's say this case, you know, does settle within that one year time period. And two million dollars or two times the principal investment is received, then on a pro rata basis, Lex shares would go ahead and distribute that capital back to the members in that particular claim.
Life settlement investments have allowed financial and banking institutions to not only buy their equity contractually, but also diversify their capital from any economic, market, and geopolitical risk. It's been part of the billion-dollar blueprint followed by institutional investors. And if you're an accredited investor, you can also now participate in this vehicle with enormous growth potential. You can watch an informational webinar presented by one of the premier organizations providing life settlement investments for number of solutions at cashflowninja.com forward slash life settlements. So in that particular example, let's just say it was 10 people putting in $100,000 in that 12 months. What would be, uh, what would the return look like uh, for investors? Sure. So the return in that example for investors w- would be as follows. So LexShares does not charge investors any management fees through the platform. We do charge investors a carried interest through the platform. So essentially, if the investment is profitable, LexShares would receive a portion of those profits. So in that particular example, if an investor were to invest $100,000 and the return on that investment, the gross return on that investment was $200,000, i.e. a $100,000 profit, LexShares would be entitled to 30% of that $100,000 profit or $30,000, and $170,000 would be returned to the investor. So an investor in that particular example would yield a 1.7 times cash on cash return. Gotcha. Very interesting. Uh, One of the questions that I had as you were walking through the cycle um, is how do they determine the the costs? Is that, uh, or the carrying costs for a case? So let's just say one party, one company is uh, pursuing litigation with another party and they need some money for that. What's kind of the, the, uh, the way that they determine it of how much they would need? Sure. It it really depends on the use of proceeds really depends on how the engagement is structured with plaintiff's counsel. So if plaintiff's counsel is on a full contingency basis in advancing all litigation costs, the use of proceeds would just be for working capital for the company. If the use of proceeds is to pay for litigation expenses like expert witnesses or discovery costs or for hourly legal fees, you know, then that would be a conversation with plaintiff's counsel, what the budget is for that particular type of case. You know, now typically if we sort of think about this in a more traditional, you know, loan to value sense, right? Or or how much collateral we would need to provide a particular quantum of funding, you know, our typical rule of thumb is we are only willing to provide up to 10% of what we believe to be the low bar of quantifiable damages, right? So in the example we were talking about previously where lectures was advancing a million dollars, you know, we would, after our underwriters take a look at that case, need to believe that the low bar of settlement for that particular claim was at least $10 million dollars for us to be able to provide a million dollars of financing. Very, very interesting. Uh, Now, a quick question for you. Uh, This is a very interesting field and there's a lot of things changing here Um, constantly. And one habit I've observed from wealthy and successful people is that they're always, uh, always learning and always studying. What are you currently studying and what are you currently learning? That's a, that's a great question, MC. What I am currently studying and learning uh, probably has nothing to do with uh, or nothing directly related to finance. Uh, I'm very much interested in studying uh, the science behind recovery and sleep. Uh, I would say the other thing that I am interested in learning about is how uh, small motors and single engine cylinders work. So uh, nothing directly correlated to litigation finance. <laughs> well, very, very interesting stuff too, because sleeping, sleeping, obviously, we all know we have to eat well. We all know we have to exercise and hydrate, but we, we somehow uh, do not, uh, I would say, grasp the importance of sleeping and the effect that that has on, not only on our health, but our performance in all areas. No question about that. Absolutely. Now, 
message in our show is to leave our families, communities, and the world better than we found it by passing down a mindset, values, and principles to future generations, not just money. So if you cannot pass on any money to future generations and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build well and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Uh, another great question. I, I'm not sure I'm qualified to, uh, I'm definitely qualified, I should say, to pontificate on litigation finance, but guiding principles for life, I'm not so sure. So I think I would just uh, leave that one with a quote from uh, Harvard professor Clayton Christensen and say it's, uh, it's easier to hold your principles 100% of the time than it is to hold them 98% of the time. That's a great, great quote, and thank you for sh for sharing that. Uh, Jay, where can folks learn more about uh, you, you and your company, and where where can they sign up for more information and stay informed of all of the projects that you guys are involved with? Absolutely. I'd say if folks want to learn more about litigation finance in general, I would suggest the book Investing in Justice, which is written by Lecture's co-founder and chief investment officer, Max Volsky. We also have additional resources, including our litigation finance 101 guide available at lexshares.com. And that's also where investors can go to register to review investment opportunities as they're posted. So that's L-E-X-S-H-A-R-E-S.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and your knowledge and providing so much value for my listeners. Very much appreciate you having me on. Thank you. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, such situation and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.